All right, well, let's get started. Joseph Scriven was born in Ireland back in 1820, and he was born in a very wealthy family. He had every educational opportunity, he wound up going to uh, college, which was pretty unusual, and he was really set up for success in life. But he had a tragedy. The night before he was to get married, his fiance tragically drowned. And, and obviously he was heartbroken, but it also awakened a, a spiritual desire in him to grow closer to God. So he left Ireland and moved to a place called Port Hope, uh, Canada. And there he poured himself into serving other people. He wanted to live out the example that Jesus said. He would chop firewood for people that couldn't afford to have firewood cut. He cared for the sick and for the dying. He lived out every day in serving other people. He was such a benefit to that area that they called him the Good Samaritan of Port Hope. Unfortunately, he wasn't done with personal tragedy. After several years, he got reengaged, and right before his wedding, his fiancée caught pneumonia and died tragically just a few days before the wedding. And it was at this point in time that Scriven wrote the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And these verses about his personal tragedy and the comfort that he found in his relationship with Jesus became his mantra. And he didn't look for any fame out of that hymn that now millions of people know. In fact, it was years before anyone even knew that he was the author of that hymn. But it reflected his tragedy and how his connection with Jesus made a difference. And since then, that uh, hymn has been translated into dozens of languages, and it provides hope and comfort for people who are going through loss and hardship. All right, here's the lie that we're tackling today. God won't give me more than I can handle. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hand, but I bet some of you have said that. And I've probably said that at some point in the past when I didn't know any better. Because it is probably the most well-intentioned lie that we're addressing in this whole series because it usually is said by well-meaning Christians trying to help somebody out when they're going through something difficult. And maybe it's your Aunt Edna who you know, comes up and says, oh, honey, don't worry. God won't give you any more than you can handle. And she says it kind of in that voice too, and it kind of makes you feel bad because Aunt Edna's comfort is actually theologically unsound. It's not true. Here's where I think this lie probably comes from. It comes from a misunderstanding of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Look at that. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You can kind of see how you could get confused in this passage because it's talking about God won't give you more than you can handle, but it's temptation, not trouble. And so what it's saying is that God will never let Satan tempt you beyond your capacity to deal with it at that point in time, and that God will give you a way out of that temptation. The question is whether you take it or not. So when we give in to temptation, that becomes sin, but temptation isn't sin. But what it's not saying is that we won't be tested beyond our ability to endure. At different points in time, all of us will be tested We'll go through something that, quite honestly, is too big for us. And the weight of that hardship, the weight of that suffering and loss can drag us down. It can lead us into depression. And we see that in our world today coming out of COVID-19. And then when a well-meaning friend, family member, Christian comes up and says, oh, you can handle this. God won't give you more than you can handle. And you can't handle it on your own. Suddenly, in addition to the loss you're going through, you feel this guilt that you aren't big enough and strong enough to handle the suffering that you're going through. And if you think about this lie, God won't give me more than I can handle, it really doesn't even match up well with the, the message of the, the good news, right? The good news of Jesus is not a message of self-sufficiency. It isn't a message of you can save yourself. It is you need God's help. You need God to save you. You need his grace and his mercy. And the same is true with some things we go through that are very difficult. We need God's help. We need Jesus' involvement in that. All right. So here's the truth that overcomes the lie. God won't give me more than he can handle. Do you see the difference? It's a huge difference between it. And if we mess this up and we think it's more than I can handle, 
we start to get discouraged and upset at ourselves. But when we understand the truth, we look to God for his sufficiency. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to John 16, It's this powerful message of this truth. And leading up to this passage of Scripture, Jesus has given his closest followers some really bad news. He's been telling them some stuff that was making them uncomfortable. First of all, he told them that he's about to leave them. He also told them that people were going to reject them. Even people that they liked, even people that they cared about were going to reject them. He told them that they were going to be hated for following him. And, and then he told them that they would suffer and die for being followers of Jesus. Pretty tough message. And Jesus' words pr- proved to be true. 11 of the 12 apostles wound up being martyred for their faith. They were killed for preaching and teaching about Jesus. And before they were killed, they were treated pretty poorly. They were in and out of prison. They were beaten. They were chased out of town. They were rejected. And, and I want you to see going into this sermon, that God didn't save his very closest friends and his closest followers from suffering. Instead, he used their suffering to spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire so that here in Katy, Texas today, we have heard about Jesus. And so we need to understand that he used their suffering for his glory. He used their suffering to spread the gospel. So Jesus gives his closest followers some bad news, but then he gives them this really good news in John 16, 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Do you see how that truth is played out right there in that one verse? Jesus is saying, you're going to get some tough stuff that you can't handle, but I'm bigger than whatever you're going through. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, guys, Here's the thing. There's going to be some tough things. But when the going gets tough, the tough get going. He he doesn't say, guys, you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps when it gets tough. Instead, he says, you're going to go through some things that are hard. And when you do that, you're going to need my help. That was the message for Jesus' followers 2,000 years ago. And it's also the message for us today. Even though we experience trouble we can find peace in Jesus. So the original word that's used there for trouble is a Greek word called phlepsis. And I don't think the NIV actually does a very good job of translating that word because it uses the word trouble there. And so it gives you this idea of some minimal, you know, a problem, little, little, little suffering, but no big deal. I, I think the ESV version does a better job, it it translates that word into tribulation, which I think gives us a better indication. But phlepsis is a word that means severe anguish or persecution. That gives you a different sense. And actually this word phlepsis, which is actually what was written in John 16, 33, it's written in Greek, that word comes from a root word that means to press grapes in a wine press to make wine. So I want you to understand what that looks like, right? Think about the pressure that's put on those grapes to squeeze every last drop of juice out of the grapes to make wine. That's the kind of trouble that Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about significant hardship and anguish. Jesus made it clear that sometimes we experience things that we're not tough enough to handle on our own, and we need his help. And I think so often when we look to God for his help, what we want is God to deliver us from our circumstances. And that's all right to pray for, but understand God doesn't always do that. And if you're waiting for the storms to pass, that may not happen. I, I think we think, look, if, if God would just fix my work situation, if you know, I could just get that raise or promotion, or my boss would stop being such a jerk, or if God would just stop my kids from doing dumb stuff, it would sure help me if that, you know, that pregnancy test could be positive or that medical test could be negative, if that could happen for me, then I could find peace and everything would be okay. But here's the point of the scripture. Peace is often found through Jesus in your circumstance rather than by Jesus changing your circumstance. Sometimes Jesus is using what you're going through for his kingdom. He may have you in a difficult work environment because he wants you to share your faith with your boss and your coworkers. He may have you struggling with some sickness or disease because he wants you to be an example for other people of what real faith looks like, even in difficulty and hardship. He may want to use your suffering for his glory. 
But when we're focused on ourselves rather than Jesus, we, we don't see that. And so we start to worry about things that we can't control, and it can cause us to become angry at God. It can affect our relationship with the people who are closest to us. It can cause us to become depressed and anxiety kicks in. We are not promised that things will be easy in this life. In fact, we're promised just the opposite. God says, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. I'm bigger than that. And worry won't make the medical test be negative or the pregnancy test be positive. It won't fix your situation all it does is cause you to have stress and anxiety. It takes away your peace. And Jesus is promising us a peace in him. And he says you can have that peace in him even when you experience sleepless or very difficult suffering. Here's the truth that doesn't sound all that awesome. God will sometimes allow us to go through things that are bigger than we can handle. It happens. So that in those moments... We have to look to him because he won't give us anything that he can't handle. Look back at the first part of what Jesus says in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me, that's the key, in me, in Jesus, you can find peace. You can't handle some of the things you're going to go through, but he can. I think there's really three different perspectives we can have when we, experiencing, when we experience hardship or suffering. The first is what I think is the worst perspective, and that's a me perspective. And these perspectives that you have will go a long way in defining how you deal with adversity and hardship. This me perspective is a perspective where you look only at yourself. You, you see only the problem and only how it affects you. So you tend to think that your problem, your suffering, your thlipsis is worse than everybody else's around you. But you also think that you've got to get out of this all on your own, that it's your battle to fight all by yourself. And boy, that causes you some problems because it causes you to worry about things you have absolutely no control over. It can cause you to become anxious and depressed. You're so focused on your own problems that you don't see the problems of people around you. And you don't serve the people around you because, my goodness, you're going through some tough stuff. This is the worst perspective you can have when you experience hardship and suffering. Now, there's a middle ground perspective where you can begin to leave the me perspective and move to what I'll call a we perspective. We perspective means that you see the hurts around you. You see the struggles that people are go going through. And when you do that, first of all, you realize you're not alone in what you're going through. And the reality is, no matter what you're going through, you can almost always see somebody that's going through something worse than you are. And that gives you a different perspective. And then as you begin to serve other people, you begin to focus less on your own problems and more on helping them. If I'm really transparent with you guys, 2024 has been a pretty rough year for my family. We've had, some of you guys know a little bit about this, we've had a very difficult health struggle with one of our kids, and that's been a pretty big deal for our family. We've also had health struggles with parents on both sides. We've, my wife has lupus, you guys mostly know that, but she's had a lot of pain and suffering this year that's been a little different than years past. Uh, one of my very best lifelong friends who was a college roommate and was in my wedding and we, big buddies, died a few weeks ago and that was a big deal. We've watched as our extended family and some people we're very close to have gone through some very difficult things. Been a tough, tough year. Even at the church, we've experienced some difficult things in our little three-year startup that have been a little different than what they've been in the last three years. I would say for me, this might be the most difficult year I've gone through since my dad died when I was eight, just to put that into perspective. But a we focus changes the lens through which I view that. Because what I get to see is, I know people who've gone through some Worse things than we have. I know people that have lost a spouse during this year or people who've lost a child this year. I, I know some families that are having medical struggles with their kids that are worse than what we're going through. And I heard and I grieve with those people and I pray with those people and it gives me a different perspective on my own suffering. But I also get to be a part of what our church is doing with some people who are suffering in our community. And so I get to see our church making a difference with homeless people and at-risk veterans, and young single moms, both in terms of making their situation better today, 
but also making a difference in their eternity. And when we serve other people, we begin to focus our attention on them and meeting their needs, and we think less about our own hardship. I actually experienced a little microcosm of this yesterday. We had a men's breakfast, which was awesome, by the way. We had a great breakfast meal that was, was there, and we had a great time of study of Samson in the Old Testament, and good time. But I was leaving, and I'm going to be honest, I was a little... I was having a little pity party for me because I'd been here and then I still had several hours of work on this sermon for today of getting it memorized and ready and then working on next week's sermon. And I was feeling a little bad for myself uh, that I had a, a day of work on a Saturday. And as I was driving out the, the driveway down towards Kingsland, I, I passed a, a homeless man who had a big backpack on. And when I passed him, I really didn't even see him. I mean, I, I saw him and I, I grinned and waved because I know that's what I'm supposed to do. And, and I got past him and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said, hey, <laughs> what are you doing? So I, I backed my car up, rolled my window down and I talked to this. It was a young man, probably late 20s. Uh, he couldn't talk. He's out in the heat. He has everything he owns in a backpack on his back. And he lets me know that that he needs some food, and so I gave him some, some f- help with food, and I gave him some encouragement and talked to him for a minute. And in that moment, I was reminded, I'm going home to a cool house to prep for preaching God's Word and hanging out with you people, which, that's not a bad thing at all. And this man has everything on his back, living in the heat, needing something to eat. And it's a reminder that when we have a we perspective, our problems don't seem nearly as big. And this same perspective can make a huge difference in how you deal with suffering and hardship when it comes. When you take the focus off yourself and you put the focus on other people, it will absolutely change you for the better. There was an article in Psychology Today from a few years ago, and and obviously Psychology Today is not a Christian magazine. It's it's not uh, a a Bible, uh, has no connection to the church or anything like that. Um, But I want you to listen to this direct quote from this article. Here it is. A new study suggests that giving social support to others may benefit the giver more than the receiver on a neurobiological level. The researchers actually used MRI brain imaging to pinpoint three specific brain benefits of giving social support or serving other people. And the underlying medical study that they were talking about in this article was published back in 2016 in the Journal of Biobehavioral Medicine. And its findings are pretty cool. So just keep in mind, they're looking at objective findings that they're seeing on an MRI test. And they see three positive effects in the brain when we serve other people. First, there's increased pleasure and contentment. Second, there's an increased level of empathy for other people around us. And the last one's maybe the most important when we think about how we deal with adversity. Listen to this. It showed a marked decrease in stress and anxiety in those who serve. Big deal. That's, that's MRI results. That's not just, that is objective findings. That's not the Bible. But I want you to look back at what they say, this quote. This is a direct quote from the article. Giving social support to others may benefit the giver more than the receiver. Seems like maybe I've heard that before somewhere. Yeah, Jesus said that 2,000 years ago, and he didn't have an MRI machine. But here's what, listen to Acts 20, 35, where Paul is referring back to the words of Jesus. Paul says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, if we had the right perspective when we experience sleepless, when we experience difficult suffering, we take the focus off ourselves, and it makes a dramatic difference. The Bible says that. MRI results, neurology says that. We can't control our circumstances sometimes, but we have absolute control over our perspective. Serving other people dramatically changes the way we view the difficulty. All right, so to best deal with suffering and hardship. We need to get away from a me perspective, and a we perspective is an improvement. But that's still not what uh, Jesus is talking about in John 16, 33. It's the last perspective that's the most important, and it's a he perspective. That's what Jesus was talking about. Take the focus off ourselves and put it on Jesus. His grace and his power sustain us in difficulty. 
And when we do that, when we put that focus on him and that trust in him, we're now accepting the truth that he is bigger than whatever we're going through. As followers of Jesus, there's so much more usually going on in hardship and suffering than meets the eye. And if we step back and we try to look at this from a he perspective, we can kind of see that. There's actually a story in the Old Testament that, that kind of shows this in 2 Kings where the prophet Elisha is uh, working with the, the troops of Israel, the, the army of Israel. And so they're at war with a, a nation called Aram. And the king of Aram is trying to set traps for the Israelite army. And so they'll hide and be ready for the Israelite army. But the prophet Elisha goes, hey, they're right up there. <laughs> Get ready. So every time they would spring the trap, they'd be ready for it and would win the battle. Well, the king of Aram finds out that Elisha is doing this. So he decides, he finds out what city that Elisha is staying in. And he's going to take the city and capture Elisha or kill him so that he can't keep warning the troops. And so let's pick up the story here where there is this big army surrounding the city. And a servant of Elisha's goes out. All right, verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early in the morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward them, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. See, it's real easy to see the problems, and the, the, the big army that's out there. But you've got to have the right perspective to see what God's up to in that moment. Elisha had a he perspective, and he saw that those are with us are more than those with them. He knew that God was going to turn a bad situation into something incredible. And there's so much more going on in our hardship and our suffering for Christians than meets the eye. We just have to see what God's up to. God may be using that for a specific purpose. He may be using it to reach someone else. He may be using it to reach your family for God, to show them what it looks like to have faith and trust in Jesus, even in suffering. In our own family, my wife's lupus brought our family back to God. I had run from God. I didn't want to preach. My wife's suffering with lupus drew me back to the church, back to God, and then I submitted and became a preacher. God healed our family through my wife's suffering. God may use your suffering for his glory or for your own spiritual growth. But here's what's so important to understand about a he perspective. You need to have a he perspective before the suffering starts. That's so important, and here's why. Because if your ultimate hope is in something other than Jesus, what happens when that's taken away from you through tragedy or hardship? Does that make sense? If your ultimate hope is in your job and you get fired, you may become bitter and disillusioned. If your ultimate hope and joy is found in the money that you've made, a, a turn in the stock market or, or a financial tragedy, man, it's going to leave you floundering and wondering what's next. Even if your ultimate sense of joy and hope is found in your family and your health, when tragedy strikes, that can be taken away as well. And, and so if your ultimate hope is not in the things of this world, but if your ultimate hope is in Jesus, that will never be taken away. His love, his truth, his grace will never be taken from you. In fact, suffering can actually drive you closer to Jesus. If he is the ultimate source of hope and joy, suffering can draw us to be closer. That's, that's what happened to Joseph Scribner. Tragedy brought him closer to Jesus, and it led him to a life of, of serving other people through that hardship. He wrote that song, that great hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, because he found peace and comfort in his relationship. And I just want to read a short portion of the lyrics of that beautiful song. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Our relationships will one day go away. Our health 
will fail us at some point. The things of this world will ultimately leave us. But when our faith and our hope is first and foremost in Jesus, that will never fail us. And then we're ready for Thlepsis. We get ready for Thlepsis by putting our trust there, by praising and worshiping Jesus. And then when tragedy strikes, we praise and trust Jesus all the more. And that's how we work through that. No matter what your circumstances, a he perspective offers peace. Because even in the very worst of tragedies, heaven awaits for those of us that are followers of Jesus. So if somebody is in a wheelchair for 80 years of life, they know heaven, eternity is on the other side of that. If I lose my wife and I spend 20 years without her in this life, I know that I'm going to see her again for all of eternity in heaven. Heaven becomes the ultimate hope even in the worst tragedies we experience. We certainly hope that that's not what happens to us in this life, but we're ready for it. No matter what comes through those doors, we're ready to handle it. Having a he perspective changes the way we view hardship and tragedy individually, but it also kind of changes the lens that we see the world about the church. You know, I get so frustrated with Christians who talk about you know, the church in America or whatever, and like we're underdogs somehow, we're losing the battle. And I just want to scream at them. I know that's not Christian, but that's what I want to do. I want to say, we are, we are not underdogs. You're forgetting who we serve. You're forgetting where our power and authority comes from. We have the God of the universe on our side. That's who's ours. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a he perspective. That's now the Apostle Paul speaks to this in the context of dealing with flipsis or hardship. This is Romans 8, 31 through 37. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justified. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Now, remember who these words were written to. This was written as a letter to the church in Rome. And the church in Rome at that time was experiencing some pretty serious thlepsis. They were being persecuted by the Roman Empire. They were being jailed and beaten and killed for their faith. Does Paul tell them, hey, you guys are underdogs, man. You're losers. No. He says, you are winners. As followers of Jesus, as Jesus' people, we are more than conquerors. That's who we are. We're overcomers. Don't get confused about the power and authority under which we live. We're on the side of the king. Let me get on a soapbox for just a minute about the upcoming election in politics. It makes me so frustrated when I hear like Democrats talking about how if the Republican presidential candidate gets elected, it's the end of our democracy. And I hear Republicans talking about, well, if the Democrat candidate gets elected, it, it's the end of our democracy. You hear both sides saying that. That's a lie. Listen, our country has been through way more difficult circumstances. We had a civil war where 600,000 Americans were killed by other Americans. And we came out on the other side of that okay. We fought not one but two world wars against somebody that wanted to conquer the world. And when we came out of that, okay. This election in November is important. They all are. But our, our democracy is not at stake in this election. Don't buy into that lie. But here's what frustrates me even more. When I hear Christians say the church, it's at stake in this November election. It is not. <laughs> we, we, this election will not change the church. You can go to the very end of the book of, of the Bible and look at the Revelation and see who wins in the end. Yeah. Jesus does. We do. When the clock ticks down to zero and the curtains fall on this world, we are on the winning side. Throughout the last 2,000 years, the church has been at its very best when the world has been at its very worst. We can look back at the Roman Empire. You know, in the second, third, and fourth centuries of the Roman Empire, 
there were very terrible plagues, way worse than COVID-19, way worse. The plague in the second century, they said that 25% of the entire Roman Empire died. That's one out of every four people died in that plague. In, in the second plague, just in the city of Rome, 5,000 people were dying every single day. And then listen to how the Christian histor historian Eusebius describes the third Roman plague. The pestilence consumed every household, and weeping and wailing filled the air on every side, and on all the lanes and squares and streets, and there was nothing to be seen except processions of mourners. Now, there's some hardship. There's some suffering. And when these plagues were at their very worst, the church was at their very best. When these plagues were happening in the cities, man, people were fleeing the cities, leaving the sick and the dying on the street, not caring about anything except getting away from the plague. But not the Christians. Christians stayed behind. They fed people. They cared for the sick and dying. And keep in mind, there's great personal risk in that because they're risking catching whatever the person's dying of. The church outloved everybody else during the hardest times. And what happened out of that? Christianity spread like wildfire because the church had a heap perspective. They were focusing on what God was doing in a very difficult circumstances and how his glory could be revealed and how his kingdom can be spread. That's a he perspective. Don't believe the lie that the church is losing anything. We are not. The church was under attack in the New Testament. They were beaten and jailed and persecuted and killed. And what happened in the Roman Empire when all that was going on? Christianity became the official religion of Rome, and now the Pope calls his home in the city of Rome. That was the greatest empire maybe that's ever existed, and they couldn't overcome the church. If we want to see Christianity spread in Katy and throughout America, we do that when the church outloves everybody else. We do that when we show intentional grace. In the very worst of circumstances, the church should be at its very best. See, how we deal with suffering all comes down to perspective. So, so let me ask you, what, what perspective do you have on suffering? Is it a me perspective where you think that your problems are worse than everybody else? Is it a we perspective where you see the, the needs of other people? Or is it a he perspective where you see what God is doing in that suffering? That lie, God won't give us more than we can handle, it sounds good. It even sounds almost biblical, but it makes us think that we should be able to handle all this struggle by ourselves. And then when we can't, we beat up ourselves. We get angry at ourselves because we, we're not big enough. There are some things you'll go through that are too big for you, but they're not too big for God. When we're going through something tough, man, we just have to throw ourselves on the grace and power of Jesus. When we do that, we recognize he is enough. I love how the Apostle Paul says this. We talked about this scripture a couple of weeks ago, but Paul was having some suffering, and he called on God to, to help him with his suffering. And this is what God says back to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. There it is. That's what we do. We throw ourselves on the grace of Jesus because we serve a God who can take tragedy and turn it into triumph. He can take ugliness and turn it into beauty. He can take loss and turn it into a win. Every storm is an opportunity for God's grace and power to be seen. So we need to have a we mentality and see what God is doing behind the scenes. He is working. Grace changes everything. So I, I want to leave you with a picture of what it looks like to just totally and completely rely on the strength of God's grace. So I want you to do me a favor. I want to get you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Go ahead. It's not going to be weird. Well, I mean, okay, maybe it'll be a little weird, but go ahead and do it anyway. Now I want you to picture in your mind this illustration that I'm going to describe. Imagine that you're holding a drinking cup. Just a normal drinking cup like you'd have for a meal. And imagine that this drinking cup is empty. And the emptiness of that cup represents the hard, hardship and the struggle you're going through at that time. It's your need in that moment for the strength of God's grace. 
Now imagine that you go over and you pick up a, a water hose. It's this massive water hose that runs off into the distance further than the eye can see. And, and as you put this hose over the cup, the water begins to come out and fill the cup. And, and imagine that this water represents God's grace. The water slowly begins to fill the cup, and, and you're not sure if there's going to be enough water to fill the cup, but there is. And, and just when the water gets to the very top of the cup, the water turns off. Now, now picture yourself coming back a little later. But this time you're carrying an empty bucket. Maybe you've had a health scare and things don't seem as certain as they once did. Or, or maybe things aren't going well at work and you're having a difficult time with your boss. Or maybe your marriage is just struggling. You need some grace, and you've got a pretty big bucket this time. You're not sure if there's enough grace to fill your bucket. But as you put the hose over the bucket, water begins to flow. It slowly fills up the bucket, and just like the cup, when it gets to the very top of that bucket, it turns off, leaving your bucket full. Now imagine that you come back later pushing a wheelbarrow. You've lost your job, and you're struggling to pay your bills. Your child's gotten in trouble again. You're having some pretty serious health issues. And so the anxiety and stress of this world is, is starting to wear you down. You need some serious grace. And you think there may not be enough grace this time, enough water to fill your wheelbarrow. But as the water starts to flow, it slowly fills up the wheelbarrow. And just enough, as it reaches the top, the water turns off. One last one. You come back again. This time you're driving an 18-wheeler truck, pulling a massive water storage trailer that's completely empty. And you know that this time there's not gonna be enough grace, not gonna be enough water. You found out that the cancer's terminal, or your marriage is over, or your company has collapsed and it's gonna take more than everything you've got, or you've just found out about the abuse. You know, you're desperate and you need some grace. You don't think there's enough water to fill this tank, but you'll take whatever you can get. And so you put the hose over the massive tank and the water begins to flow. The water doesn't fill the tank immediately, but you're amazed as the water keeps flowing and flowing and the tanker truck begins to fill. Then eventually when this huge tank is completely full, just to the top, the water turns off. Well, now you're curious about where all this water is coming from. And so you start to follow the hose to the source. Seems like you walk a really long time. It feels like mile after mile. But there it is, a vast ocean of water that goes out further than the eye can see. Whatever size container you come to God with, that's what he fills with his grace. There's just enough. So my encouragement to you is, man, back your truck up and fill it with God's grace and feel the power of God. Now open your eyes. I want you to hear these words that Paul says that God told him, and I want you to embrace this for yourself. God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And, and so my prayer for you today is that you leave here and you live in that beautiful truth. Let's pray.